I tell people, one of the treatments, one of the prescriptions I give my patients, I'm like, you have to masturbate. Yeah. They're a doctor. I'm like, yes, you have to yeah. masturbate. And they're, I can't sleep really well. I'm like, masturbate every single night. There we you go. know what my mood is? My mood is low. Masturbate. Oh, around noon, I feel this. I'm like, masturbate around noon. Around noon. I'm like, listen. And honestly, what was that big fat Greek wedding? One of my patients told me, like, you are like Windex. Put some Windex on it. <laughs> you are like that guy. Welcome to Clitorology, intelligent information about women's sexual health from leading experts in the field. I'm Jacqueline Buckingham, founder of the Women's Intimate and Sexual Health Foundation, CEO of Huge Pussy, the activist brand changing the meaning of pussy, and your host. Every week, I bring you the top physicians, plastic surgeons, sex therapists, gynecologists, psychologists, our nation's chief clitorologists, and the most renowned medical experts and thought leaders in the field of women's sexual health. We'll also talk about intimacy and how to have your best sex life, because we know sexual health is connected to mental health and longevity. Having intelligent information means a better life for us all. But women's sexual health has some catching up to do. So it's time to tap into your huge pussy energy and get ready for class, because learning about women's sexual health is healthcare. Welcome to your new favorite subject. This is Clitorology. My next guest is known as the Vagina Whisperer, Dr. Amir Marashi, a global OBGYN and vaginal surgeon making waves in the world of sexual wellness. As an internationally acclaimed physician, he's dedicated to revolutionary work for his patients and to being an activist for victims of female genital mutilation. He is the only person to launch a designer vagina fashion show. And he also has collaborated with the world's top feminist artists and writers to champion a woman's right to pleasure. And that's not all. Dr. Marashi, along with his colleague, Dr. Levy, has crafted a pleasure prescribed product line called Saray. Together, they're breaking boundaries in sexual wellness and women's pleasure. They produce the first clitoris shaped vibrator designed for the female body. He's also now teaching other doctors his innovative procedures like the Vagilangelo. Here's my conversation with Dr. Amir Marashi. Hello, Dr. Marashi. I am so happy you are here today. Hi, Jacqueline. Thank you for having me. I'm happier. Love to start with your background and how you got to be known as the Vagina Whisperer to people around the entire world. You know, I I grew up in a family of uh, physicians. My father is a physician and I lived with him in the hospital, I mean, lived with my family in a hospital since I was uh, three, four years old. So don't remember anything else and I didn't know any other job to do so I had to become a doctor Um, back then it was in the middle of the war that we had uh, it was Iran Iraq war so my father used to take care of the casualties of the war and they would just roll them in in a dump truck uh, like literally dumped them in front of the hospital and as a kid who loves his dad I was just following my dad all the time so initially I was in charge of you know, carrying white sheets to cover faces of people who are deceased so they can pay attention to the ones who are alive. And then slowly I learned to check pulses and do more and help them triaging the patient. So finished high school when I was 15, went to medical school, 15 and a half, 15, finished it in when I was 22 years old and then left the country. Um, I was doing surgeries during medical school before them. I did a lot of hymenoplasties back in Iran. You know, my friends knew I know my, uh, you know, way around surgeries and I have access to operating rooms. So they would come to me if uh, their girlfriend or somebody or they wanted to get married and they're like, well, you know, I have to be a virgin or I can get in, you know, big trouble. You know, the double standard, you know, Jacqueline. Yeah. It's, uh, you see the the guys can do whatever they want to do they have hundreds of girlfriends they have sex with anybody they want to and then when they get married you have to be a virgin right and i didn't have any problem you know helping these girls lie to them because you know it's first of all is to save their lives sure and i didn't think anywhere else but back in iran or you know some third world countries 
would have that problem until I came to England and then I came to U.S. Right. And I saw that, you know, the difference of the way that men and women are being treated yeah. is global. It's, it's not just Iran. You know, you may not care about being a virgin here, but still there is like all that, you know, shaming that, oh, she's a whore if they see her having like two boyfriends or if she's posting something on Instagram. It is a very gender biased word. And because of that, I wanted to be a part of this change. In my practice in gynecology, um, you know, my first practice was in Brooklyn. Still, I go there still to do surgeries. And I dealt with a lot of patients who were victims of female genital mutilation. Yeah. I realized, well, the problem is not hymen here. The problem is something else. They want to make these women into baby-making factories. They cut the clitoris, the glands of the clitoris or whatever of it that they can cut, and they, like, literally t- turn them into a baby-making factory. They shouldn't enjoy, you know, life. They shouldn't enjoy sex. And I, I felt like this is my calling and I want to do more and more. So the book was helpful to kind of raise awareness about that. The brand I started, everything I'm doing, I'm trying to take the taboo away from, you know, this whole situation, because there, there's no problem about female pleasure. There, there's nothing wrong with it. And those of us who, you know, may not know as much about Sharia law in places like Iran, where you're from, for a woman not to bleed on the first night, she must be dirty or used or, and, and as as we know, that can result not only in torture, but in death. But then, as you know, having your hymen can can rupture from going on a bike ride. And so how does that factor into how things are today? Even the countries that, uh, you know, practice female genital mutilation, yeah. they've come a long way. They, they are they have. doing less and less. And there are so many organizations. One of them uh, we are actually getting involved with, uh, the ORCID project. They are, what they are doing, they are not about, let's go help these people who got the FGM. What they are doing, they try to prevent it, you know, educate families that, you know what, this is not necessary. And some of these families started doing less and less. But what I mean is that they used to cut, let's say, a big part and they would cut the labia minora and everything. Now what they do, they just cut a little bit of the clitoris, which is... It's still really bad, but no, it's it's hard. It's really hard to to you know applaud that. But I understand that it can be baby steps in some cultures. But it's still in its in its essence what it's about is you know whether it's tradition or or not, and however many years it's gone back in time, it's still about women don't deserve to feel pleasure. Exactly, it's harrowing. But I love what you're doing, and I love the background that you come to this work with because you have seen it in such a different perspective than let's say if you were, you know, from Texas, where you are now, uh, where I'm from, and didn't have that knowledge, didn't have that experience. And from the book, you can tell that this is where so much of your passion comes from. And it is so genuine, which is why I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so happy that you are practicing and doing what you're doing and serving women in the way that you do. And so how do you practice now? Who do you serve now? I love doing nonprofit work. I've been to Afghanistan. I go to Haiti. I actually have a nonprofit. I go to Haiti since earthquake. I've gone over 10 times. I do all of these, but of course, uh, what's important, you need to bring more attention to what's going on here because I'm just one person. So uh, that's what I've been trying to do through doing things like we are talking to each other right now. Yeah. And I feel like this is a lot more powerful than one surgery that I do. That surgery does a lot, but hopefully this podcast is going to inform hundreds of people who are going to talk to another hundreds of people. And I feel like these are really the groundwork that we should all be doing. And I'm so thankful for what you are doing. So I dedicate a lot of work to doing this. I started, you know, people laughed at it first. They said, listen, you either going to lose your medical license for this, or it's going to be really good. So I did the first designer vagina fashion show in New York city. 
Yes. And the name was very loud and people say, oh, he's doing a fashion show. It, it wasn't a fashion show, people walking naked or right. anything like of that. Of course. You know, it, it, but it, it actually attracted the press. So the press came out. First designer Regina Fashion Show, they all showed up. They had over 150 articles within the first 24 hours written. Uh, back then, uh, Trump was running and he was always like the top headline on New York Post was the most viewed. For three days, we were more viewed than Trump articles, which was great. Amazing. <laughs> So it brought a lot of attention, and I'm, I'm glad that we did that, the way we did yeah. it. It was really patients who came and they talked about their experiences. They said how, uh, you know, this changed their lives. And this is not just, you know, fixing FGM patients. Of course, that's uh, one of the things that's really close to my heart, and I do that. But this is also, I work on regular patients who are trying to make, let's say, their orgasms better enjoy sure. sex better so that's one of the things we are doing i do a lot of cosmetic gynecology and functional gynecology surgeries i do a lot of labioplasty vaginoplasties yeah. i don't call the vaginoplasty vaginal tightening because i mostly work on fixing the angle which we can right. talk about because that is really what's important and you know back in england um I did a little bit of sports medicine. You know, my father is an orthopedic surgeon, so I did a lot of ortho with him. And I love biomechanics. Uh, you know, biomechanics is the mechanics of your movement and everything. And it was very difficult for me. Why isn't there any studies on biomechanics of intercourse? So interesting. Such, a, such an amazing point. So true. We started this company, Saray, uh, which uh, is, we make sex tools. I don't call them toys, but anyways, uh, we can get into that. But everything that we are doing, I hired another doctor to work with me. Which yeah. She's my right hand, Dr. Lavi. We want to figure out how we can really find out what gives pleasure to women and what doesn't. Right. We, because there are so many of these sex toys out there, so yeah. many gels out there, and people say, oh, this, this works, this is magic, this is not magic. I've been doing a procedure on my patients for the female genital mutilation patients to see how much of this clitoris is left. Because yeah. look, this is the clitoris. I have one too. Perfect. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. Um, it's so great. And we'll get we'll get to like why and everything else. But go on, please. When you look from outside, and that's what they taught me in medical school, they said clitoris is this little tiny prominence that you see here. But that's not the case. That's that's only this tip part of it. So clitoris goes much deeper, just yes. like a penis, you know, anatomy is like penis, but these two are not stuck to each other. And what happens with clitoris is that just like penis gets erected, clitoris gets erected, gets a lot of blood supply to it. So I'm like, we need to figure this out. Yeah. And on the FGM patients, what I do, I do clitogram, which we created ourselves. So okay. we do an ultrasound on the clitoris to kind of see what's going on and how much of it is left. Okay, so what are you doing when you're actually doing the ultrasound? How are you able to see how many nerves are being stimulated? You don't see the nerves on ultrasound. You see the vessels. So okay. the penile ultrasound being around forever. Yes. You know, it's very easy, Jacqueline. Let's say we, me and you, have a company and we invented Viagra, right? Yeah. You get like 10 guys here, uh, you give them like 50 milligram of Viagra to each of them and turn on some porn, get them naked, mm -hmm. all of their penises are gonna be straight. And you're like, oh, you know what? Or nine out of 10 and you're like, oh, 90% effective. We know it works. But yeah. for women, you cannot really substantiate this. So exactly. that's what we wanted to see, that erection. What do you use to test for, for women since so much of our orgasm is in the brain? You're absolutely right. So the brain part, we can't change it too much because the brain, as you said, 90% of orgasm in women is in the brain. But let's say 10% of it is physical. And the problem is that when that 10% doesn't happen, this 90% doesn't happen either. And when the 90% doesn't happen, 
you don't even want to go towards that guy because it's, let's say, you, you've got to be, and that's why physical attraction for women is very important. Is there a place for, you know, Addy, the female Viagra? Is there a place for that in your practice? I've been working on this gel called Enchantment Gel for the past five, six years, five minutes before you have sex with him, or even just use it as a foreplay. Okay. Use the Enchantment Gel, which right now we have it in sachets too. I'm like, apply some or have it with him be like applied and play with the clitoris. Now, what's going to happen? This is amino acids, arginine yeah. and L-citrulline. Yeah. They bring the blood supply to your whole entire clitoris. So now the clitoris mm. becomes a, a lot more engorged. Now, if you can get away with something that's non-pharmaceutical, and we went through many other formulations that are out there. Yeah. You know, a lot of these orgasms gel that you have out there, orgasm gels you see out there, they yeah. are either like menthol, what they do, they cool down or they heat it up or right. they just have arginine. But remember, a part of population cannot turn arginine into citrulline. Okay. And so what does the citrulline do? Citrulline is really the one that brings the blood supply. So your body turns arginine into citrulline. Now, some people who can't do it, that's why they cannot, you know, they cannot really get that erection. The problem with citrulline is that it could be very potent. So initially mm. in our formulations, we are like, oh, this would cause a lot of irritation. So yeah. we had to find like a sweet spot. And that's why we went through so many formulas. And then because two physicians kind of developed this, we yeah. had to make sure there are different things that none of the gels that you see out there, I'm not here to sell the gel, by the way, but uh, we got the Beacon Awards uh, for, you know, for the same reason, we made sure is pH friendly with the vagina. So it's the same pH of your vagina doesn't give you yeast infection, doesn't give you bacteria. Does it have the effect of when I use it, does it lose efficacy if I keep on using it? It's always going to be effective. It's okay. not going to lose efficacy. I mean, okay. look, we have a refractory period for men, which means that mm -hmm. a guy cannot get, you know, erection after he just ejaculated for a while. Yes. For women, uh, that refractory period doesn't exist. It's really like close to zero. So that's why people can get multiple orgasms. So for women, this is very helpful and by the way a lot of guys use it too and they it increases blood supply okay I mean, so I it's fine for them you can put it on the penis no problem oh 100 percent, 100 percent. great great and is it is it something that is okay to consume orally or not we, we are not recommending for people to consume it orally we, I would like but if if you use it i mean if you placed it there and you have oral sex it's an amino acid. It shouldn't cause any problem. Well, it's pretty interesting. And I, I love how your tagline is pleasure prescribed. And when we talked the other day, I told you about a lifestyle medicine teacher of mine at Harvard who was prescribing exercise. And that was a really revolutionary thing at that time to think about, like rather than just, you know, here's a pill, but here's an exercise. Here's actually something you can do. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the physiological benefits of orgasms for women. For women, it's been a taboo for many, many years. Just like anything else that's been a taboo, like I, I deal with a lot of patients with endometriosis. They're like, oh, you know what, pelvic pain, my mom told me is normal, you know, suffering yeah. is normal for women, you get your period, you have pain. So it, it became normalized for them not to really enjoy sex while well, you're doing this for your husband, honey, you know, it's okay exactly. not to enjoy it. Just right. fake it so he comes faster. So right. uh, this is, uh, 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 and that's why I tell women, look, it is very important yeah. to get good orgasms. Why? Yes. Because first of all, what do you get out of it? You get endorphins, internal morphines, you get oxytocin. Let's break these things down. Oxytocin is the happiness hormone. It is, I mean, it, it, during your labor and all of those happens too, but it's really the happiness hormone. They make a spray of oxytocin for hundreds of dollars and people nasal spray, just spray it because it makes you happier. Guess yeah. what? You get a lot more and a higher dose of oxytocin with having one good orgasm. So yeah. even if you don't have a partner, that's why I'm, I tell people, one of the treatments, one of the prescriptions I give my patients about, you have to masturbate. 
yeah. they're a doctor. I'm like, yes, you have to yeah. masturbate. And they're, I can't sleep really well. I'm like, masturbate every single night. There we you go. Know what my mood is. My mood is low. Masturbate. Oh, around noon, I feel this. I'm like, masturbate around noon. Around noon. I'm like, listen. And honestly, what was that big fat Greek wedding? One of my patients told me, like, you are like Windex. Put some Windex on it. <laughs> you are like that guy. It's so true. There are these phenomenal benefits just when it comes to overall quality of life and stress reduction and, and things you can actually measure. And if someone does want a tool, and I'm absolutely with you on the sex tools, not sex toys. I've, I've always felt a little strange about the toy thing, but sex tools, fantastic, because that's what they really are. You know, sometimes you need them. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you prefer, you know, a wand. Sometimes you prefer a clitoral stimulator. And I think that it's very cool that you can just say, you know what? How about try this one? Cause you're actually looking at their anatomy and saying, well, <laughs> we've done the clitogram. We can actually see that you could use more help, let's say, in the G-zone area. Or if you're really focused on the clitoris, you know, focus then on something like this one. And by the right. way, this was so fun. Look at, I love the flexibility. The see? flexibility is amazing. And it's, it's, I really like how also on your website, it shows you, you know, here's how you use them. This is one that I, I do want you to explain a little bit because this is the only clitoris shaped vibrator that I know of that's ever been designed. And as a feminist, when I learned about this, I was like, oh my God, that is so exciting because so many vibrators are going to be shaped like a penis. So it's so fantastic to see this one. The past 28,000 years, they've been making uh, tools that look like phallus, yes. look like penis. So many of them, from starting to use like cucumber to bananas to all yeah. of those to like actual tools that look like phallus, 28,000 sure. years. This is the first one that looks like clitoris. Honestly, when I made this and we designed it, initially we didn't even have, want it to have a motor in it. We want it to just be something so you kind of show your partner and show yourself even to women oh. to kind of be like, you know what, what is this? And believe it or not, I took this to Times Square. Yeah. We went to 100 people and like literally only one person knew what it is. People called it penguin, people okay. called it bird, yeah. called it, uh, what is it, mouth guard, wishbone. We got so many wishbone, wishbones, by the yes, way. I can see that. I can see that for wishbone. sure. So many wishbones. Okay, bones. so originally, this was just supposed to be like an anatomical model, like, hello, partner, this, right. is, this is what I've got going on. I actually have an erection inside my body that you can't see. Right. That's amazing. Okay, and then what is the thing that made it go, oh, you know no, what? Let's we decided give it a motor. to put, yeah, so three motors actually. So there's one I on the, uh, yeah, so there's one here and two here, one here, one here. So really, when you want to put it against the vulva, this part sits right on the clitoral glands and the other two sit right on both sides. Technically, they are stimulating the entire clitoris. Now, I remember this is a very small tool and it's our first version so it's not a very strong tool i recommend this more as a foreplay tool okay. which is really good you show it to your partner it's flexible it's fun you know put it against my clitoris see what my clitoris is like put it on here lick this lick me whatever they want to do people yeah. tell me about the stories and things that they do and sure. it's full on Full on pleasure tool, if you want to get to like full orgasm, very strong, yeah. would be something like the Spellbound. First of all, it has vibration in this part. It's on. So this is, this is internally yeah. uh, for your G-zone. And this part is uh, not suction. People think it's suction. It's actually air pulse. Okay. Because when you do suction, what the suction does, it causes a lot of stimulation and irritation on the clitoris. So this doesn't just pull it in all the way. This keeps like blowing it in and out. Oh, interesting. Because that is what I thought of when I first saw it. I was like suction, but I was like, but it seems a little bit larger than the other ones. Exactly. But then obviously I read angle. about it. Yes, the angle. 
The angle is amazing. I mean, it is hyper flexible, which is and super cool. It stays the way it is, and it is really good. So it gives you, so this is one of, we actually did a study on this. We did clitogram as we were stimulating with this one. And yeah. the amount of stimulation that it causes, because look, this part goes inside, yeah. right? There and this go. part is outside. So it is stimulating inside, inner portion of the clitoris. Right. And the outer portion of the clitoris yes. simultaneously. So I, I, I have people who told me oh, they can't really get orgasms, you know, ever. And yeah. I told them, guaranteed, use this. Yeah. Three minutes after that, to start using this. And if you don't get an orgasm, and they're mm -hmm. like, wow, I think I was getting orgasms, but this is a completely different feeling. You yes. know, I'm shaking, this happened, that happens. Because, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, in the book, which we haven't really gotten to yet, um, one of my favorite writers, Erica Jong, talks about how the world is so afraid of female sexuality because it's in, inexhaustible. And it that's is. something that I find to be tremendously exciting when it comes to the orgasmic capacity of women versus men. And why is it scientifically, why is it that we have so much more orgasmic potential than men? They are much stronger. Look at the pain that women can go through. The body is a lot more resilient. Yes, yeah. you don't have that as much testosterone as men have because we had different functions. Right. But in reality, it, we, we were talking about in exhaustion. That's exactly yeah. what I was talk, telling you about the refractory period. Yes. For women, there's like the refractory period is zero. For the guy, he had sex once, he's like, why are we inexhaustible? What is it that makes our orgasm so much stronger, so much more complex? And we can do it again and again and again and again. As soon as the ejaculation happens and you go flax, it doesn't matter how much, of course, with the help of Viagra and like Cialis, you may be able to, but what's going to happen is not going to be immediately right after right. that. Right, you know? right. But for women, the thing is that if you can continue, and of course, uh, some can, some, some do a better job, some can't, but reality, getting multiple orgasms for women, it's so much easier yeah. because initially you don't need the, that erection. You know how I think about in the book, I say, I feel like God was a man. I don't want to get into creation, evolution, any of sure, those, sure, sure. but whatever you got as a woman is a lot stronger. And I feel like men saw that and they wanted to shut it down. And that's why you see in all cultures that, oh, women should stay home, women should do that, they should just cook and clean, because if they could release this power. And if we go back and look at ancient cultures where female sexuality was celebrated, you know, that, that came to a screeching halt. And one of those things, and I heard you talk about this, and I was really happy to hear you talk about it because I talk about it, is when Dr. Sigmund Freud called the clitoral orgasm an immature orgasm. And then from that point, the clitoris was like removed from medical textbooks. Is that, is that correct in your experience? We didn't have clitoris in any of the medical textbooks. And that's what happened yeah. exactly with Freud. Because before that, there are images from like German anatomists years right. ago yeah. that clitoris was there. We had it in Gray's Anatomy, the first editions. It was there. But it was completely. And why did he call it immature? Look, I tell you one thing. Because he was immature. It's uh, <laughs> unfortunate to say this. I mean, I think he was jealous. I think he yeah. was jealous. I think he was like, I don't have one of these. I want one. Therefore, I'm going to, <laughs> you know, make it like something that is like, you know, kind of uncool. And that's what he did. Only until recently that you see there are like heads of departments in medicine could be like women. Even right now, there aren't too many women. as They yeah. still call it like chairman. Oh, chairman of department of gynecology. 
in exactly. why don't oh, even if they are a woman they're like oh who's the chairman oh exactly uh, dr sarah something uh, well uh, call yeah. the chairwoman you know i think the more we talk about these things and the more awareness we have of the gap the more we can actually do something about it and so if we are the microcosm of the macrocosm and i said you know what i am going to lessen the orgasm gap today <laughs> by using this 40 times then you know so be it it's it's it may be something small but it actually adds up and i think the more entitled we are to pleasure as women the more we give permission to our friends to our sisters to our mothers the more we talk about it the more we actually make it not so taboo something that you you know talked about is cosmetic gynecology being functional and I think cosmetic gynecology has a little bit of that stigma around it. Like, oh, I see, you know, just kind of like breast implants, right? From many years ago. Oh, wow, you're going to go get that or, or you're going to, you know, they're almost like a misogynistic, you know, factor about it. When really what I've learned is that so much of it is around functionality. And that's where the angle comes in. It's all about the angle. And most people don't know this, um, that, that some people are going in for, for vaginoplasties or labiaplasties because things aren't working, things aren't functioning. And yet we've been so conditioned to suffer in silence that, that we'd almost like not go to someone like you, even though you're an expert in this, because we think, oh no, that is like asking too much. Talk about the functionality part. Talk about the angle. I tell people, we all start like a plumb and we end up becoming like a prune. You know, we lose water, we lose collagen, we lose a lot of fat. And in yeah. our faces, you know, I start from here, in our faces, after age of 35, we are losing five grams of fat every single year. So same thing happens with the angle of the vagina. So if yeah. you look at the vagina from the side, it's not a flat organ. So it's not that the penis goes in like this. No, vagina is like a has a downward angle. That's the normal angle of the vagina. And I use this all the time. So this is the entrance of the vagina. It goes down like this. Why? Because the clitoris that's sitting right on top of the vagina, right? So this is the glands part of it that gets stimulated. And then the internal part, the front wall of the vagina is very sensitive because it's sitting right underneath the clitoris. And yeah. they have that 12,000 nerves, 10,000 nerves that you are talking about. They're all sitting in the front wall of the vagina. So right. when we say vaginal orgasm or clitoral orgasm, it's yeah. really all clitoral orgasm. But it's the internal part of the clitoris that you don't see and you were not talking about it. And that's exactly. why I don't call it even a G spot. I say, you know, it's the G zone. It's so the it's zone. the entire, it's the zone. So yeah. that's why when the angle is downwards, which is the right angle, yeah. and that's what we were born with, and the penis enters, it hits the front wall of the vagina, right? right? So right. it hits the front wall of the vagina and yeah. it stimulates that. So yeah. what happens with aging as we age, this angle becomes flat. Mm. Now you are having sex and it doesn't really, it rubs against yeah. all different walls, but it does not rub against the front wall as much as it used to. It okay. used and to be why like is this. That? Why, is it, why is the angle changing with age? You see, this is the entrance of the vagina. Yeah. There is a tissue underneath here between anus and uh, vagina yeah. which is called perineal body. It's right. built of collagen and a lot of connective tissue. As we age, that becomes thinner. As we have kids, that becomes thinner. So the mm -hmm. entrance comes lower, right? Ah. So the entrance used to be, anus was here, the entrance was here, there was a lot of space in between them. Now they are almost close to each other because with every kid we had, this is stretched or with just aging, this kind of dropped, just like what I told you in the face. Over the course of time, this happens. And so what does that mean? Does that mean that everybody, you know, needs to go get this plumped up? What does that actually mean for us? So not necessarily look different. First of all, by keeping the muscles, pelvic floor muscles strong, you can kind of make up for that. That's why Kegel exercises are right. really important. Okay. You know, and that's why it's good to do like Pilates, yoga, 
yeah. keep the pelvic floor strong. I'm not just creating a tight, tight, tight tunnel vagina no. for your partner to enjoy it. Yes, the yeah. partner is got, they're like, oh, but we do it and the partners love it. I'm like, yeah, but you want your patients to enjoy it. You know, I created this procedure that uh, Vagilangelo, we actually, um, because in New York, uh, my New York office, patients don't have the time to, so many of them, oh, we don't want to have a full on vaginoplasty. So for a while, I was doing a lot of lasers. And I'm like, okay. you know, laser vaginal rejuvenation is not, it's effective, but yeah. it doesn't, it tightens the lining of the vagina. It doesn't really do anything with the muscles. Right. So I came up with like three stitches that we are doing to kind okay. of just fix the angle without uh -huh. taking the patient in the OR, you know, so okay. we don't pay, take the patient to the OR. We do the vaginal oh. angelo procedure as the patient. And that I created it in New York because I'm like, you know, patients would come in and they're oh, can we do it today? Yeah. I'm like, sure. So we started doing really? more and more. So we, we like literally did it in the office, 20 oh. minutes, you're in and out. Okay. So can you get out the model again and just show me where those three stitches are? If you want to do a full on vaginoplasty, what you really do, you're opening the entire area. You go all the way deep to the muscles. Yeah. So for yeah. this one, what you want to do technically, you don't want to go uh, do all of that. You don't make the vagina tighter necessarily. Okay. But what you do, you bring the entrance of the vagina higher mm. and from inside. And the level that I'm working at is at the level of uh, your basically hymen that you had before, hymenal ring. All it is, is it just the three stitches or is there another component that no, comes with it? It has another component. So okay. we do the three stitches. So yeah. you are, um, let me show you. So I do the three stitches. So you changing the angle, you bring yeah. it up. Yeah. And then I enhance the G zone at the same time too by... Okay. PRP and exosomes. Now, a lot of people just do PRP. Yeah. I like to add exosomes to it because it makes it a lot more potent. What are exosomes? I believe exosomes are one of the most potent anti-aging agents out there yeah. that don't break the bank. Of course, if you can afford it, uh, you can go all the way for stem cells. And that's what you know, some of my patients, my basketball wives, and like people who want to say, oh, you know what, I want to do the best. Well, well you know what, we can extract the stem cells and sure. do A, B, C, D, but just the lab procedure and all of that part of it is going to be like $10,000 on its own. And some of them Absolutely. say, oh, you know what? You've got to extract the fat and then you've got to spin it. So basically you're doing exactly. like a mini liposuction. And so it's, it's a lot more involved. It's a lot more involved. So, yeah. But for okay. exosomes, our cells especially when we are, let, let's say, when we are a fetus or when yeah. we are very young and even at this age. But the younger we are, they have more of these. They talk to each other. They communicate with each other. And that's how they stay young. They tell each other what to do, yes. you know, to make new cells, make new like vessels, make new nerves, all of those. And they talk to those little vesicles. And now you can extract those from different ways. I mean, you can get them from umbilical cord, you can get them from placenta. There are okay. different ways depending on what company you are getting them from. And right. they go by by billions. So you can get like 5 billion, yeah. they usually come in increments of 5. So 5 billion, 10 billion, 25 billion, all of those. Okay. So I, I add between 5 to uh, 10, 10 billion of exosomes with a good 10 to 15 cc's of PRP. And okay. that yeah. is that is very potent. And we injected mm, a lot of these patients, we inject just, you know, in the vagina. And then we do on labia uh, majora as well. You know, these two okay. areas, okay. people who have like a lot of wrinkles and say, oh, I want a fat transplant. I want to go oh. get a fat transfer. Just we inject it underneath the skin and we do it a couple of times. Oh. They feel so much better. You really? can do a microneedling. You do it underneath, you know, the cheekbone, uh, oh. underneath the skin and the cheek bone and all the face and everything you can put them everywhere they are they are very good so you're basically doing the prp so using your own blood spinning right. it and then putting it back in but then also you do the exosomes exactly i okay. dilute so a lot of people dilute the exosome with just normal saline yeah what uh, yeah. i do i dilute it with prp is this a one and done or is this a i come back 
Uh, for, for the vaginal is one and yeah. done. One and done. Vaginal okay. is one and done. But of course, for the exosomes and PRP injection, we can come on back. I tell people they can do it like every six. This is just for orgasm improvement. You can do it every like six months. My job with this show and what I love doing is bringing the top people here and then learning about what they offer. So then, you know, you might be perfect for this person, but not perfect for this person. So it's exactly. great to know though, and bring it all together. So whether it is, I want to enjoy sex more or sex is painful, I would think that you're getting those people that are coming to your practice for those reasons. Am I right? Or is there a, a, a whole other predominant reason that I, that I'm not thinking no, of? No, of course. A lot of people who don't enjoy sex, yeah. who have painful intercourse, yeah who don't even think sex is that important for them and they right. come for other reasons. And when I start talking to them, you know, they, and, and sometimes, you know what, believe it or not, I have them bring their partner, whether yes. their partner is a male or female. Absolutely. I, bring, I bring them, this husband and wife who came to me uh, from Michigan. And this guy is very well off. I mean, they came with private jet, all of those. They flew to me. And he was very upset because the wife listened to a podcast and she's like, oh, we have to go to this doctor. Yeah. So yeah. brought the guy and they basically not enjoying sex. Uh, yeah. The kids have gone. And after the one hour that they were in the room and I talked to them and I said, what we got to do and what I have to do today, you know, guy. And then at the same time, I said, you know what? And you guys need to have more sex and do A, B, C, D. And by the way, I actually recommended anal sex for them too, for some other reasons. Sure. And by the end of it, this guy is like, you know, his eyes are sparking up. And I'm like, okay, you were so upset when you came here. She's like, yeah, because she dragged me here, but I'm going to be here every single month. I'm going to come right. see you. Because now I learned that this is actually so important. And I see yeah. she was never interested in sex after this one hour. You told her this is necessary for her body. This is going to help her, you know, even cardiovascular system, all of those. And yes. she became a happier person. And he, he was so happy. He's like, I wish I came to you like two years ago. I do feel like every relationship should have this book. Thank you. <laughs> okay, your book really and truly blew my mind. This is not the book that I actually expected. I mean, this book has the top feminist writers and artists that we know. And the images are gorgeous. The words are gorgeous. This book is basically going to be my Christmas gift to everyone I know. It is absolutely stunning. So I just want to say thank you for making this book happen because truly I am also of the mindset that art and medicine come together and you did it so well with this and you brought such incredible messages from people like Roxanne Gay and Erica Jong to artists like Ellen Von Unworth to Nan Golden and brought them all under this one place but then you're also bringing the medical to it, which is so incredibly important. I am very proud of this book too. And, you know, the work that we did, these are things that need to be said. And, they are. you know, we need more people like you who come out here openly and talk about it. There's no shame about orgasms. No. There's no shame about woman's sexuality. No. And the, the more we talk about it, you know, the stronger the stronger this movement is going to get, Absolutely. which is very important because we need, look, we all, that's what I always say. We all came out of a vagina and uh, all our life, we are trying to get back into one. So <laughs> you, thank you. you need, sure. This is what I'm saying here. I'm like, isn't this the place we all come from? Like, why <laughs> exactly. would we be shaming our home? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Call me crazy. And you're, you're so right. It's the place we come from. And then, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get back there. It's, it's such a beautiful and fascinating organ. If you just look at it, just, just as an organ, just the vagina, the vulva, the clitoris, the, all of it just biologically is completely it's fascinating. Art. It's, it's art. art. I mean, <laughs> right. And, and I love that it's, it's a bit like the brain and space and the ocean in which we actually don't know everything yet. So thank you for, thank you for creating this phenomenal product line. And thank you for also, you know, sharing it with me because 
I saw this and I was just like, oh my God, I, I'm not, this goes to all of my feminist friends. <laughs> and, and this is really incredible. It's so unique. And the gel is, is really very interesting. I didn't know that about the L arginine uh, not being able to be converted into the citrulline by some people, but that's fascinating. And, and you know, the more, you know, right. The more, you know, it's definitely it's just great to be able to try so many things and know that whatever it is that you might be experiencing there's probably an answer to make it better thank you for having me here i really appreciate your time thank you i just want to thank our listeners sponsors subscribers and founding members of this show who believe in furthering the field of women's sexual health if you're loving clitorology as much as I am and want to support our continued mission to bring you intelligent information about women's sexual health from leading experts in the field, go to clitorology.com and follow us on social media at clitorology. It's my pleasure to bring you the top medical expertise and thought leadership that's furthering women's sexual health at no cost to make sure that you're intelligently informed because learning about women's sexual health is healthcare. This has been your favorite subject. See you next time on Clitorology.